Welcome to Law Talk, the show that brings you the law, the Constitution, and the events of the day to you each month. Tonight, we're very fortunate to have an up-and-coming Congress, Congress person that will be elected out of the 1st District of Missouri. Myself, James Barrett, and Mark Malachowski. Mark, why don't you introduce our guest? Okay, Winnie Hartstrong is running for Congress. And tonight, I, we kind of got here into the last minute, but we're going to talk a little about immigration, maybe a little about, about the Flynn case, and then I think Winnie has some strong opinions on the monuments. I, we had here in San Francisco, where Francis Scott Key's monument, who, he wrote the Star Spangled Banner, was torn down. So maybe we'll go through the first couple subjects kind of quickly, because those are kind of, uh, kind of legal, technical things, and then we'll let her take the, the, in that last subject. But Winnie, why don't we start out, give me a little, uh, give the audience a little background about where are you from, what made you decide to run for Congress, and what, what was your inspiration to want to run for Congress? Hello, Mark and James. Thank you so much for having me on. I, you know, tried to tell, take the LSAT and bombed it terribly. This was in the year 2009, and I knew from then on that I was called to do other things, which is learn how to be an advocate, learn how to study logic, and learn how to piece together evidence to make a claim sound reasonable or unreasonable. And that's what I've done. I've taken my teaching and my skills in rhetoric. I taught public speaking for many years at the University of Maryland, where I got my PhD in communication, specifically political rhetoric, political communication. And so when I saw what was obviously a very <laughs> contrived event happened in the city of my birth in Minneapolis, I put all that together and I put my little red MAGA hat on. And I, I don't know if you saw the video of me that went viral in the MAGA hat. And I said to America, stop being so emotional. Why are you crying? What are you crying about? Okay, someone was killed somewhere far away from where you are. So why is that? Uh, suddenly making you want to take to the streets and tear things down and burn things down. And I am guessing that that video has now reached the ends of the earth because I've had people from as far as South Africa reach out to me to talk about that video. I have people from Europe, all across Europe, despite the language barrier. My video was uh, transcribed and closed captioned in Spain and people in Spain have been reaching out. I have people in the Netherlands who have reached out. And you know why they're doing that? They want America to get this race crisis right because the, the, the archetype of you know, white and black racial strife has now been transported abroad. Even though Ireland, I have a good friends in Ireland now. Ireland, Ireland has no race problem that we know of. But the issue with George Floyd's death has been taken up and put in the Irish media. And now the Irish people are being told that they have a race problem. So we need to get this issue right. I know we'll talk about some other things uh, according to your outline there. We'll talk more specifically about that. But as a way of introducing myself, I think this is how the world has come to know me. And this is how America has come to know me. I embrace that heart heartily. But my entry into politics was really very, very personal and had nothing at all to do with racial issues. It's really for the unborn. I'm doing this because my mom, during her pregnancy for me, had considered an abortion very seriously. So wow. seriously that she had an appointment with an abortion doctor and she went to the appointment with my aunt and was determined to abort the baby, me. And luckily for her, it was 1989 in Minnesota. And at that time, when the establishment said that they wanted abortion safe, legal, and rare, they meant it. So when women wanted to see an ultrasound, they were given the chance to do that. So my mother had the presence of mind, praise God, to ask the abortionist to see the ultrasound. Because, you know, those ultrasound machines are typically in the room there. They use it to guide the procedure but they don't always show it to the woman. So my mother is a very strong woman. She has a master's in computer science, wow. was a mid-level bank executive back in West Africa for several years. And she said, well, I wanna see the ultrasound. And she sealed her fate in that move because she saw the baby me 
wiggling my toes and waving my fingers, she said, and that changed her mind. So she flew off the examination table and flew off there for her dear life and my dear life. And here I am today. Thank so if God. my mom, <laughs> amen, praise God. <laughs> if she hadn't had the courage to do that, then I don't know if I would be alive today. But here I am, and we know many, many children don't survive that procedure. We know that every minute, every hour, Planned Parenthood kills uh, the approximate size of a kindergarten classroom. So think about it, killing a kindergarten classroom since 1973, that's millions of people who should be alive today who are not alive today. So this is my impetus for coming into politics as well, opposed know, to going on. Excuse me, I don't mean to interrupt you, but you know today the Supreme Court actually came down with some, some uh, rulings that dealt with uh, the same subject. And remarkably enough, the, the rulings were like seven to two uh, over the, the little sisters, uh, the poor or whatever, that group, and who've been fighting this forever. And there seems to be a pushback, maybe a groundswell. Now, they did suspend the Alabama law on that when they're talking about, remember, the Alabama law, which they just came out with last week, saying, no, nah, you can't really make somebody have admitting privileges to a hospital. But you can see a wave. You can see a wave that is, thank God, taking back the the solemnness of life. And uh, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you, but it's a very no, sensitive subject. No, that's perfect, James. That's perfect, because I was going to say my tagline, I usually have a pithy quote that I come up with before I go into an interview. And my quote for your show today was, the law is madness. It is like an insane asylum musical dance <laughs> because you, and then every so often out of the chaos you have some sound rulings as opposed to when god gave moses the ten commandments and all the 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 precepts that the israelites should follow that was order out of chaos now we just have chaos 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 and every so often we have sound teaching because the law is a teacher the law is a teaching tool which is why i could never get myself to be good enough to go to law school because it seemed like you had to make so many compromises about good teaching in order to do the job of being an attorney. That's but right. anyway, kudos to you guys. You guys get it. <laughs> but yes, the okay, Supreme well, Court ruling today was be, very encouraging. <laughs> my quote would be what Napoleon said. He says, there's, there's so many laws, I'm surprised they haven't hanged everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, let's, like start a little bit, let's start a little bit on immigration. We had a big thing that happened here that I thought for the California and the USA citizen taxpayer, government, the governor Newsom has this thing and he says, if you're a good Christian, you should want open borders and let everyone over the borders. So he paid uh, basically whoever wants to come over $75 million to come to California and vote. That's $75 million. He, and it was supposed to be for COVID-19, but I think it was to buy, buy votes. And so but just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you're a patsy. And that's actually a betrayal of his constituents, right? And if yeah. you're a Christian, a betrayer is, according to Dante, go to the ninth circle of hell, ninth, ninth circle of hell, which is interesting that it's a frozen lake. So I got a feeling maybe Dante had a cold apartment or something. He definitely wasn't a skier. <laughs> but, uh, but it's kind of interesting. And then Frankenstein had the frozen lake, too. That's how he fell in the frozen lake. But anyway, yeah, yeah Christians don't have to always... Uh, cuddle up with strangers and let them break into their house. So, I mean, I think that's a big thing that's come on that everyone says, well, you should be nice and let, you know, everybody over the border. Well, you can't let over everybody over the border. And it's also not fair because we have a lot of, uh, you know, indigents and vagrants and people without jobs here that aren't being taken care of. And to give, you know, just anyone who wants to come over the border $75 million of taxpayer money when we are, when California is in debt, you know, it's, oh, I think that's a betrayal. So what do you think yeah. about immigration in general? What's your thoughts on immigration? Oh, wow, Mark, that's a good question. My family is an immigrant family, a very recent immigrant family, too, because my parents came to the U.S. in the 80s. My father is a retired Secret Service officer for a country in West Africa that will remain unnamed for <laughs> safety reasons. Yeah. But he and my mom decided that they wanted to have a, an American life and they came here legally. And over the years, over the last 30 years, they've gone back and forth. So actually I have 
a British education from West Africa. And then I came back to the U.S. for college. So I was born in Minneapolis, but I've lived everywhere. And I understand that as we evolve as a human race, that uh, the convenience of modern travel will make it easier for us to choose where we would like to build our lives and build our families. But in this modern equation, we have to take into account certain things. Uh, that scarcity is the real enemy. We have scarce resources that do not permit for every single person who would like to, let's say, live in Japan, in Tokyo, to do so. And so the Japanese government will have to do things to make it difficult for the whole world to end up in Tokyo. We know Tokyo is a beautiful developing city. I have a relative who will be going there for his graduate studies. So my family is very international, like I said. And that's beautiful because he likes the Japanese language. He would like to go there and live there. The same has been the case for the United States for centuries. However, as we evolve, we also need to obey the laws of the land. The laws of the land have created stipulations for how to come into America. We have the diversity lottery visa. We have uh, uh, relatives sponsoring their relatives to come into the United States. There you go. But even then, it, it serves a benefit, right? Because then you can be documented. We know who you are. We know that if you suddenly um, fall into poverty, we have a relative who has vowed that they will take care of you. We know that uh, there are people that you can rely on as a safety net because there's paperwork that has everyone's contact who filed for you to come to America. So even there, we shouldn't have scores of immigrants on our uh, in our safety net program. Well, Those programs... If you, if you look at some of the uh, you know, Bear Stearns and some of the uh, economic uh, analysis of uh, illegal aliens or foreign in, infiltrators, what do you want to call them, spies, um, there's about 50 million at large in the United States right now. And we've got a population of about 300 million. And so three, so a sixth of our population are, we don't know who they are, right? Yeah. And they also tend to end up mostly in our prisons. Um, because a lot of people, like say from Mexico, I'm familiar with some of the Mexican immigration, and a lot of those people, if they stayed in their country, they'd be hung because they've murdered people down there. So this is the only mm -hmm. place they can run to, and they can do it. They they can murder here and then buy another some more papers for fifty bucks. They've got nothing yeah. to lose, and so you know you're kind of in a rough situation if you're a taxpaying citizen and you're up against someone who's wanted for murder in their home company, you know, they've done a couple of murders here. And if you get a confrontation with them in the street, they're not going to want to be taken to jail because they don't want to get deported because then they'll get hung. So these people are desperados and you've got 50 million of them. So we've got a little bit of a problem. And I understand that, you know, everyone, you know, there's different types of immigration coming in. But That's right. basically since 1965, they've opened the floodgates to anybody or nobody. Now, kind of the joke is, the problem with our southern border, if you look at the map, it's a dotted line, you know, and anybody can kind of go through those, the, the spaces. The spaces, the, the yeah, spaces yeah. in between. Between the dots. <laughs> That's our problem is we, the, that, 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 that dotted line there. So really what we'd have to do is make the border shorter if we invaded Mexico and Central America and our border was on Panama, it'd be pretty easy to protect. But we have a, whatever, 3,000 mile border and that's a big problem. And also, you yeah. have a lot of um, uh, a lot of folks like Newsom, who I think most of his voters, you know, in California, about half of the population of El Salvador lives in San Francisco, L.A., right? Wow, uh, that's huge. 13. And so they all vote Democrat. And there's they say there's no voter fraud, but that's just not true. Most of the mm -hmm. illegal aliens are voting Democrat, and it's not really fair to citizens. For one thing, to tax us and say, here's 75 million to pay these guys to come in and vote. And then to have, let's say, 10, 15 million, you know, illegal aliens in California, probably 5 million of them voting. And most of them, you know, probably not making enough to support themselves. And so they're, if you're a poor U.S. citizen, you can't go to a hospital. You don't get these benefits because they've already been taken up. So I think it's a huge thing for Americans right now. It's like, why is a sixth of our population basically foreign infiltrators? And I, I think it's huge. I think it's huge because you see people, indigents and vagrants on the street, but $75 million, for $75 million, you could have taken care of every single indigent and vagrant on the street. 
California. Amen. Amen. And that's yeah. not happening. So I just think that Newsom really betrayed us. But anyway, that's kind of my thoughts on the immigration. On the next thing we have, uh, Jim, I want to talk a little bit about Flynn. Um, about what? General Flynn, and he got in trouble because he kind of clashed with Hillary Clinton over the whole Africa. Uh, and General. Thing. You're talking about General Flynn. Yeah, General Flynn. And he got okay. in trouble with the with the Clintons because he didn't agree with them on basically the, uh, the European becoming Islamic, right? And so they really had it in for him, and so they set him up pretty bad. But I think it goes back. We well, had a why whole don't show we ask Winnie like, what she believes about? I mean, that we have we have the opportunity. I'd like to hear Winnie. Um, you've seen all the political turmoil since the day Donald Trump got elected, and as you look at that, it's been one one issue after another, nonstop, supported by mainstream media. And you've got the, the leadership in the, the House, and you got all this going on. But one thing that has been proven that's been really turned up is, like Mark said, General Flynn. It shows that the whole cabal, you know, from Comey, even Biden, Straw, Page, Susan Rice, there's been this long, long little mission here to destroy General Flynn. And they took him down for one reason, because he was a Trump confidant and he didn't, he didn't like what was going on in the prior administration. So Winnie, what do you think should happen as an example with General Flynn now? And what do you believe we can do to kind of root out this issue that seemed to be continuing to tear down the president? Yeah, thank you for that question, uh, James. I remember the end of 2016, it seemed like they had set up the next presidency to be a war, wartime president because then they started by kicking off the Russian embassy delegation. You know, they kicked them out of their uh, property there in Maryland, which yeah. is where I was actually. I started my whole political career in Maryland. I ran for Maryland State House in 2018 and I'm a very new Missourian. But yeah, I think General Flynn, I read some reports that his intervention in calling out Putin and saying, hey, you don't need to react, you don't need to retaliate. Once Trump comes in, we're going to smooth things over. We know that you did not participate in election interference. I think I've seen reports where in doing that, he prevented World War III. Yep. I don't think that's an overstatement. I think General Flynn put himself his reputation and his knowledge on the line to prevent an escalation with Russia that would have landed America in the midst of maybe not a hot war, but definitely a, a cold, cold war by January 2017. And because of that action, he was targeted, like we've seen now in the notes that have been released by the Director of National Intelligence, and that, you know, thereby forcing Adam Schiff and others to release their own transcripts of what happened. Uh, and then in 2018, we got uh, a red, a blue wave. Nancy Pelosi, I don't know how she managed that, but I think it was the ballot harvesting laws that led to a blue wave where some stronghold Republican seats were taken over. And then we got the squad, the four ladies, <laughs> Ilhan Omar, uh, Ayanna Presley, Talib, uh, what's her first name? Uh, the, the, the woman from the Middle East, yeah. the, the Palestinian American woman, and, and then we have AOC. And they have been the source of so much, you know, they're not, and they're not really serious women either. So it's like taunting, you know how St. Paul says, I have a thorn in my flesh. I yeah. feel like that's, that's really what they've been, just like annoying little children, prat, you know, prattering on about how, oh, the president said this about me. Well, you insulted his whole existence and his family and his, you know, everything that he stands for, which is America. And so I think it was so appropriate for the president to label them the squad. But then well, coming the thing, now the thing, to... The thing about the squad, though, when you follow the money, um, Soros funded the four squad. He, Jim, he, he funded about another 40 other... Yes, in fact, I, Winnie and I had talked about that. Yeah, and so I, I mean, Soros, Soros through when you're talking about that blue wave, Soros in the in and he put about two billion in black money at least through the Caymans for the Hillary elections. He could have put a hundred billion or a trillion. It doesn't matter. They can print the money. I mean, the Soros people 
their mob can print the money. So they have unlimited cash. They just print money and our dollars become less. So I mean, we use yeah. that money. So um, they have unlimited cash. And I think the only reason Trump won is because he took them by surprise. You know, they could have, they thought, oh, we better let them take two or 3%, right? Because they had no yes. idea. And the reason no Trumpsters said they're voting for Trump's because they didn't want to get audited. They didn't want to get fired. They didn't want to have their houses burned down and they didn't want to, you know, be killed. So Trumpsters aren't that stupid. They know that if you said I'm for Trump, because when I was uh, going around, going door to door and, 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 you know, canvassing for Trump, I, uh, I would go, wow, you're voting for Bernie. And they said, vote for Bernie. Yeah, I'll buy you a beer, right? And then if they said, no, I'm not voting for Bernie, I would say, oh, you're voting for Hillary. You're voting for Hillary. Yeah, Hillary. Blankety <laughs> Trump, right? And if they go, no, I'm not voting for Hillary, then I go, well, who are you voting for? And they go, well, I don't know. And I said, let's go somewhere quiet and talk. And that was a Trump. Oh, story. I but see. Nobody publicly was going to admit that they supported Trump because you'd be killed. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you've got to look at these same guys, this Schiff, Schumer, this whole bunch. They've been kind of this little cabal. You know, if you look what they did in the gulags and the Holodomer, they killed uh, 12 million people in Ukraine. They killed right. uh, another mm -hmm. 64 million in Russia. They're the same that's bunch. Right. So, I mean, when you see these things, what I see out of the street, that's your typical cabal action. That's your typical mm -hmm. Sort well, of, Mark, Mark, I'm, I'm wondering if you're doing any door to door now and if you think those silent majority voters have increased in number or if it's just about the same. It's very well, I, I worked on a campaign for uh, against Nancy Pelosi's seat. Right. And we had her on the show a couple of times and uh, Deanna Lorraine and we did some canvassing. But what that group was doing was we we're going and cleaning up. Um, where the homeless had trash and needles, they were doing cleanups yeah. there, and they were threatened with being killed for cleaning up trash, right? Oh, wow. So, you know, it's like in San Francisco, I mean, it's almost a joke. If you were, if you were a MAGA head, you'd be killed. I mean, it'd be a death. <laughs> so, it's absolutely out of the question. You know, you couldn't do it. Um, right. Hey, well, why don't we go? Why don't we go back to Winnie and uh, Winnie? I'd like to hear what you consider are, are your hot button issues that bring out your your desire to run for the Congress. Absolutely, like I started out saying in my introduction, I am a heart woman. You know, a heart for the unborn. I I have a life. I have breath. I have uh, a family, and I want to put all that as evidence on the table for the potential that is the unborn. And a lot of atheists, a lot of feminists will say that it's not a child until after birth or it's not a child until after the first or second trimester. Well, if it has the ability to someday be a Winnie and breathe and speak and have a PhD and a husband and three kids, then it's a life that needs protecting. So my very first priority is to pass a personhood amendment. And that amendment will just follow science. Democrats claim to be the party of science, but when it comes to the science of life in the womb, they are very faulty. They are lacking in their knowledge. So I wanna say when a life is detected, especially when we can detect a heartbeat, which is very early, around six weeks, that person is no longer a part of the mom per se, but that person should be protected by all the laws of the United States of America, especially the 14th Amendment, which guarantees you know, protection for all people. Uh, my second priority is to work on a federal Child Victims Protection Act, because I am Catholic, like James and I talked about at the intro, and I was in DC in 2018 when Cardinal Worrell was taking some heat because when he was a bishop in Pennsylvania, he presided over cover-up of clergy who had abused children. And there's abuse everywhere. Yeah. It's just, I don't want abuse in my house of worship. And I'm not about to leave the Catholic church. So the abusers have to leave. Right. So well, what I a, did- there's a, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, things going on in the Catholic church. Uh, and basically after 1962, there's a new church. And before 1962 was the old church that would which had been that way for a couple thousand years. And what happened is you had the Polish Pope who wasn't perfect either. Um, he ignored some things, but he was down in Nicaragua uh, trying to fight the Sandinistas and he ended up getting shot. Uh, he got shot yeah. in the head, I think, but he didn't die. 
And that's the last time a Catholic has fought. And the, there were people who are what I would say are the part of the cabal and opposing as Jesuits. They took over the Catholic Church. So I think that's the, right. That's the right. The church is not like the old Catholic Church at all. Yeah. If you and and the way that the way that it's it's kind of complex, you know, you translating from Hebrew to Greek to Latin, right? And the, yes. a lot of stuff was lost that was the Greek. And actually, some of the some of the some of the best translations are actually from Latin because those those documents were destroyed. Um, but if you start looking at the translations that come into English for the Bible in the last since 1962, yeah, uh, like the most we talked about this before, like "Thou shalt not kill." Well, that's not what it says. It says "Thou shalt not murder," right? Oh. And so there's a big difference between "Thou shalt not kill" and "Thou shalt not murder." Okay, sometimes you have to kill, and in fact, mm. you're not even supposed to commit suicide, right? And also, you yes. Are required to do self-defense and self and defense of others. Um, but you know, when they start doing these translations, a lot of the translators try to put in their own uh, their own opinions, and that happened so much in the last 30 years that you know it's really straight away from what was the original um, the, the original scripture. Yes, Mark. Yeah, you're so correct. But I was getting at the fact that I want a federal child victims act because, for what it's worth. The new church is what most people know. It's what most young people have grown up in. My family actually attends a traditional Latin mass in St. Louis. We attend St. Francis de Sales Oratory. And, you know, the priest is facing Jesus and we're facing Jesus with him. So we're in the old church, you know, we're old souls. At, I'm, you know, born in 1989, 30 years old. But I think it's time, if you look on my website, winnieheartstrong.vote, I talk about a new American renaissance. We really need to get back to what it means to be a classical man, man and woman, to be a classically trained mind. And part of that is getting back to restoring faith in tradition, faith in our faith tradition, which is a Catholic faith tradition, for those of you listening who are Catholic. And to do that, we need to restore faith in the hierarchy. So I petitioned Pope Francis on change.org actually in 2018. And I think it's the first time that a petition had ever been directed at the Pope and it took the Vatican by storm. <laughs> they were so confused, like what? There's a petition to the Pope to remove a sitting <laughs> Cardinal? But I did it, I did it. And that was very eye opening for the hierarchy because it exposed them and exposed the fact that many of them in there have infiltrated the church and are just really, you know, they're saying the words, but there's no faith behind it is what, that, what I found. So after much pressure, the petition got close to 145,000 signatures. Wow, I was on all the news outlets. Yeah, thank you. This was two years ago. Okay. I was on every news outlet, Fox News, Breitbart, talking about how we need to hold Cardinal World accountable. He needs to step down. And at that point, he had already submitted his resignation because he had reached the age where you had to retire at 75 but the pope had not accepted it so what i was saying and some other people were saying is he made a terrible you know lack of judgment in shuffling priests around who ended up abusing other young people where they went and he should just accept that resignation from world and give us a new cardinal bishop or give us a new bishop uh, eventually that was done. So I formed the group Catholic Lay People Orthodox Bishops and Reform. And that group has been active praying in front of the Vatican Embassy, trying to get the Papal Nuncio, the new one, Archbishop Pierre, Christophe Pierre from France, right. trying to get him to give us a brand new bishop who will do the right thing. And even after we got that bishop, we saw Cardinal World come back. He was back at, uh, there was a prominent funeral. I forget who died. Uh, oh, I think George Bush, George Herbert Walker Bush, I believe, died and he was at that funeral. And then he was at the March for Life rally for youth. And we we're like, wow, he's supposed to just go away. But anyway, <laughs> we kept trying to make sure that Archbishop Pierre, the papal nuncio, would do the right thing and make sure that the hierarchy, at least present in DC, would be attempting to to be clean and attempting to be holy and i i was sad to leave the archdiocese of washington now i'm in the archdiocese of st louis and there's much fewer instances of clergy abuse because a lot of those clergy have passed away 
Um, but frankly, I still am good friends with James Grine. Mr. Grine is a good friend of mine. We chat very frequently. And James Grine was abused by former Cardinal Theodore McCarrick. Right. And the church has still not produced that McCarrick report. It's been two years since the Pennsylvania grand jury report was released that shows McCarrick having a hand in, in abuse of children. I mean, Mr. Grine is now an older man in his 50s, but the wounds on Mr. Grine's soul are just plenty. And on his person, he needs to be protected by the law. So New York has passed the Child Big Protection Act. I believe Connecticut has passed one too, but we need to elevate child abuse to a federal crime and have a federal law that protects young people in any situation well, in the can classroom. I ask you, what are the tenets of that law that you have in mind? Because it sounds like it's it's an excellent law and should be at the federal level. But what are, what what's included in that law that would prevent uh, the type of abuse you're describing? That's a good question. I think uh, I would need some stronger legal minds to help me with that. But at the very bare minimum to expand the statutes of limitations would be a necessary part of it because many states have um, a window by th during which you can bring a lawsuit against an abuser and for many of the people who are abused by clergy because of the, the shame and the scandal that right. comes with accusing an authority figure especially a religious authority figure they're very slow to bring forth their claims uh, so we need to give uh, some allowance for that. But I'm not, you know, I, I am a person of logic and reason. I would not want such a law, such a provision to be used in retaliation against a good man or a good woman or a holy man or a holy woman, holy priest. We've had instances of that in Michigan where priests are falsely accused and then the investigation is pre uh, done and we find out that it was a a false accusation. In fact, I worked for a time for Archbishop Ninestead of Minneapolis, Minnesota, and he is one of those who suffered terribly. In Minnesota in 2012, there was a marriage amendments campaign that was put, it was an issue campaign, a ballot initiative, mm -hmm. and I worked on that campaign to make sure that traditional marriage or natural marriage defined as between a man and a woman would be encoded into the Minnesota state constitution. Archbishop Ninsted was the Archbishop of Minneapolis St. Paul at the time, and he was very supportive how he had the priests offer a prayer for marriage at, at the end of Mass. He had groups praying, he had groups supporting our campaign out in the open. And after the campaign lost, that was the first year it lost throughout the United States that had been winning in years prior, in 09, in 08, it won across the South. But when the other side mastered our playbook, before we could put out an ad saying children need a mom and a dad, they had an ad out saying, love is love. <laughs> it doesn't matter who you love. It's well, so you don't, <laughs> hang on, Winnie. You don't want to get Mark and I started on that one because no, we well, know we fed that okay. into, remember the <laughs> gentleman that was elected in 208 who said, marriage is between a man and a woman. And then it was, I have an evolving perspective on that. And as yeah. soon as he got reelected, it's, nope, you can be anything you want. You can do whatever you want, man, woman, dog, tra trans transgender. Now, and then we get Obergefell, a correct? Yeah, but, well, I mean, I think, if you, but in a broader perspective, if you look at the 1950s, I mean, first you had the, uh, I guess you call the progressives killed uh, 84 million people in Europe. And these are not combatants, non-combatants. You got to understand when these folks take over, they wipe out basically anybody who can grow a beard. You know, that's, that's usually what they do. And so they killed yeah, 12 million Ukrainians, 64 million uh, or so uh, Russians in the Gulag. And then they went to China, the same group, same Schumer Schiff cabal. There's no difference to these guys. It was all um, Mordecai, uh, uh, what was it? Well, Mordecai Marx, who they call Karl Marx, and you had Lev. Uh, uh, David Ivich Borenstein, who he called himself Leon Trotsky. They always have aliases, but they're the same family. They're all intermarried. And so they killed 84 million people in Europe, and then they went to China and killed 60 million there, right, in the 50s. You got to understand that was a population of 180. So when you kill 60 million people out of a population of 80, 180, you're just basically killing anybody who can grow a mustache, right? 
You keep the women yeah. and children because they're easier to control. And when you look at the Maoist philosophy or the Marxist philosophy, it's all the same. They're against religion because the government is God, right? And they're against the family because there's no such thing as a father because the government's the father. And they're against private property because basically the Marxists get to decide who gets what. And the way they do it was with mathematics, you know, because if you're a Marxist, two plus two can be four if you're paying a conservative. But if you're paying one of your own, like if you're Nancy Pelosi's cousin and you're getting COVID-19 relief, two plus two is five. So basically, if you're a socialist, you get to count the apples. And so it's like two plus two can be four or it can be five because it's, there's no 10 commandments. There's no right and wrong. There's no, you know, it's all how you feel about it, right? And so if you feel that this person should only get one apple, they get one apple, even if they grew all four, you know? So, mm. that, so it's a, that's how they work it. And it's no different what Mao said or Marx said. Um, they all want to destroy three things, private property, the family, and any type of religion. I mean, that's yeah, always, right. always comes out over and over and over again. And even people who are like, believe in like Aristotle, maybe you, you were maybe you were a pagan maybe you weren't religious but they did believe in an afterlife now no marxist believes in an afterlife every one That's of them right. thinks this is all we're going to get and get it while you can mm -hmm. and they're you know i'm just saying that's a big difference and i would say there's all kinds of religions right but yeah. most, almost all religions believe in an afterlife and so mm -hmm. but they want to they want to get rid of that and just you know it's all happening right now and this is it mm -hmm. And, that, and that's what makes them successful. So they, it's all these in different colors and different flavors, but it's, you know, they want to live in a private property, the family and religion. And it's always comes to the same thing. Yeah, I think that's a difference in my candidacy and the people who are supporting me. It's really a Christian renaissance, a Christian resurgence in American life. Because a lot of Christians for the last few years have just backed out of political involvement. They've gone back to their churches and practiced the right to worship, uh, which is not the same thing as freedom of religion. But now they're seeing that even the right to worship, which is to go into a closed space and pray to God how you deem fit, is being attacked. And I'm coming with that fervor. I pray in the name of Jesus all the time. If Ilhan Omar and Talib can, and Rashida can say all kinds of things they want to say on their Instagram and Facebook and call on Allah every other sentence, then I can call on the name of Jesus. And I do it often, and I'm not ashamed of it at all. I think we need to get back to a place where we're understanding that the political sphere is also under the lordship of Jesus. It's under the lordship of the Almighty. And when we recede from that, when we... Uh, accept this false idea of a separation between church and state, then we are murdering the very freedom of the Republic. So I'm coming as a young 30 year old woman, hopefully I have a long tenure ahead of me, uh, whether we win this race or not, where I am saying we need to bring back, like Kanye West said, we need to bring back prayer in schools. Kanye was good about that. He did that for his interview, I think uh, over the weekend. He He's also said we need to. So Kanye that's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, he what's said if you bring about, back what's prayer interesting school, about that is that there's nothing in the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence or anywhere anything. I think that was the, well, there was a certain Supreme Court uh, that decided that, Blackburn Court, I think, but there was nothing in there that says there's a separation between church, church, church. Yeah, it wasn't Black um, Amazing. I mean, it, these it people are terrible. should not be infringed, <laughs> but that is kind of like, uh, you know, that is what you call the living constitution. You know, the living constitution is kind of like you have a mortgage and you're supposed to pay $3,000 a month and you go, well, the living mortgage, I'm only gonna pay you 200 bucks a month, but I still get a spot here. You know, like a living constitution, I mean, the, the constitution was lit, written for the ninth grade level at that time, which is about a high school or a freshman in college because education is not what it used to be. Um, That's right. But that, you know, the Constitution is not that complicated, and you'd be surprised how many people haven't read it. It's only like 14 pages, but there's nothing in there about, you know, you can't have God or there's, there's no religion. It says your, your, your right to worship should not be infringed. How you got that flipped over so you can't be religious or it's not allowed to 
Yeah. I, mean, I don't know how they You got know, to it's that so way. funny because it, I, I greet people logic. all the time. Pretzel logic. What's that? Pretzel, pretzel yeah. logic. By, I think it was the, you know, a certain, the Blackburn court, the same thing about 65. And yeah. uh, you got to understand that, um, you know, there was a lot of legislation, legislating from the Supreme Court and from the courts. And that kind of twisted the Constitution. So you wouldn't even really know what it is. And if you look at Ginsburg, right, she said, our Constitution be, should be like the South African Constitution. I don't know if you've read the South African Constitution. I have a whole dissertation on South Africa. <laughs> well, you're it's a, a good, scary well, consultation. <laughs> <scary. laughs> well, I did my yeah. dissertation on Nelson Mandela because wow. I'm named after his wife, his well, wife, Winnie Mandela. Well, so thing, it was a natural return. Yeah. Well, I don't know. the Winnie, Winnie I don't really have the greatest... Um, she had the Winnie Mandela, the Winnie Mandela necklace, which wasn't the most pleasant thing. No, she wasn't up. perfect at all. But no, understand that in 1988, when my parents conceived me, and when I was born in '89, uh -huh. uh, they were very much in the consciousness of, you know, African power and Pan Africanism and Free Nelson Mandela. <laughs> so. So I got anyway, listen, uh, Winnie. Winnie, I wanted to thank you for coming on tonight. I, I allow the show to go a little long because I love everything you're saying. I'm a huge okay. fan already, and I wish I could vote in Missouri. You'd have my oh, vote. And you'd have you my so family's much. vote. Okay? Oh, thank you. But anyway, listen, um, if possible, maybe we can have you back. If you, yes, as long I'm as you have an election coming up pretty soon. This, but no, we but are yeah. we're at the end of our show, and I want to thank you and Mark. Uh, I'm sure has something. Well, what, nice what is to the date? What is the date of the election there, Winnie? Before we it's, sign off, what's the, it's August fourth. August fourth. August fourth. Okay, so we're I, all going to be rooting for you for August fourth. Go ahead and win this one for us, please, I will, Winnie. I will. Please, we need you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> God bless you, want, you guys. But anyway, thank you. you so much tonight, Winnie, and. I am so happy to hear you talk about religion making the comeback, the renaissance, because Amen. that is going to help every aspect of society. Yeah. Okay? Thank you so much, Winnie. Okay, goodbye. Good bless. Right, Winnie, go, thank go you. Go there and win on August 4th. Yes, right, sir. Good luck. <laughs> thank you.